All right, so you've heard me say in the past that for bone health, nutrition is king. And you've heard me talk about the challenges that we have in the nutrition space. There's a lot of challenging information. I don't like the word misinformation because usually that just means that somebody doesn't agree with somebody else. But there's a lot of challenging, confusing information in this space. So I was presented with this study that I initially kind of dismissed because you've probably heard me talk before about the alkaline diet, my thoughts around the, the literature supporting the alkaline diet, and that I don't believe that it really has a role in the world of bone health. I think it misguides most people and we really should just ignore it. However, I was presented an article that is very specific to a certain group of vegetables. The theory behind this is that this group of vegetables is going to be more alkaline than others, and that we would see this group of vegetables really shine as an intervention when it comes to bone health. So I was curious, the person that passed this along to me, I won't mention her name, but she's a physician. She does incredible research. She's a, a wealth of knowledge in the world of bone health, and she encouraged me to look deeply into the study. So I'm happy to do it. I would love to prove myself wrong. I think it's one of the most important things that anybody who considers himself a researcher or a scientist should do is to try to prove himself wrong rather than just prove himself right over and over again. So um, this study, if I thought it had a lot of value, would prove me wrong. So let's see what I found. Okay, so this study, again, is looking at a specific group of vegetables and fruits, and they're looking at urinary calcium excretion. I'll explain that in a minute. And they're looking at this thing called potential renal acid load, or PRAL. And the whole goal here is that essentially you're going to um, monitor urine output, and you're going to look for how much calcium is in the urine, and you're going to essentially look at each of these foods with their potential renal acid load. And then, of course, they're also measuring urine pH. So they're really trying to prove that these vegetables are quote unquote alkaline, meaning they reduce the renal acid load, um, and that there's going to be an impact on bone turnover markers. So they're really trying to connect A to B, which, as you can imagine, would really contradict what I usually say about the alkaline diet. So what did they do in this study? Well, they had 150 people, which is a, a fair number of individuals for a nutrition study. Let's face it, they're usually pretty small. There's not a lot of money for this type of uh, study. And then they divided them into really three groups. So group A was what was considered a generic range of vegetables, herbs, and fruits. So more what you would get, you know, I don't want to say standard American diet. This wasn't done in America, but a standard diet for the area. And then group B is the actual desired intervention. So this is what's called the Scarborough Fair Diet. And this is a very specific group, and I'll go into those, um, but a very specific group of veggies, herbs, and fruits that may have some resorption inhibiting properties. And then group C was a control. So usual diet, don't change anything, just eat what you normally eat, and then we'll compare. They did this for the course of three months, which again, for a nutrition study is... You know, it's kind of long, meaning that it's not one or two weeks. But if we're really going to see a change in bone health, we really need to see longer duration. We need to see six months, 12 months uh, or longer. And they did even say that this is a pilot study. So this was intended to be a short duration. And the power then of using bone turnover markers is that you can see changes in bone turnover markers in the short duration. So they go on to talk about in the beginning all of the, the normal alkaline diet things, which I'm not going to get into all the details of. But essentially what they're saying is that the foods that are increasing urinary pH calcium excretion, meaning calcium excretion goes up, those foods are going to cause bone loss. The challenge here is that depending on the composition of the diet, that calcium may not be coming from bone. In fact, in humans, most likely it's not coming from bone. The body is smarter than that. And so if you look at studies on rodents that are eating a calcium poor, high protein diet or high um, renal acid low diet, those animals do lose bone because they have to buffer the pH with something and they're going to pull it out of your bones rather than die. So this is a last resort thing. We don't live in that environment. We also, most of us in the osteoporosis world, aren't eating a calcium poor diet. And so um, this doesn't apply to humans, but this is their, their underlying theory, which uh, as you'll see, this how this plays out. Um, the underlying theory is, I think, flawed. All right, so what is in this diet? Well, it's kind of a long list, but it includes things that I consume and recommend like parsley, sage, rosemary, thyme, 
garlic prunes, some citrus fruits, uh, bok choy, red cabbage, lettuce, um, rocket is listed. I don't know what rocket is. Uh, onions, broccoli, tomatoes, mushrooms, cucumbers, leeks, and green beans. So yeah, I'm, I'm down with all those things. None of those stand out to me as things that I wouldn't want to recommend, not necessarily personally eat, but wouldn't want to recommend. There's an emphasis with these things that they're high in polyphenols, they're high in potassium. Now, with any nutrition study, compliance is really important. And that's why some of the best studies were done sort of as an inpatient ward study, meaning that people are actually like stuck inside somewhere and they're fed their food. That's really the only way to control what people are going to eat because humans are, let's face it, in general, not particularly honest, especially when it comes to what they eat. And so they asked people what they ate and they asked them if they were compliant. And they said that they were quote unquote compliant. They didn't really talk about what that means. Was that 90% compliant, 50% compliant? Who knows? Um, but they had them do a three-day food record at specific intervals, and then they used that to justify whether or not they were actually eating the thing that they wanted to eat. They provided food for group B, but not for group A, and, and obviously not for the control group. So there's a little bit of bias here where the, the B group may have actually had better access to food, although in the end it doesn't really matter. Then they looked at P1 and P, and they looked at CTX at six and 12 weeks. So this is pretty cool, right? These, these are guys who are using my biomarkers that I like, P1 and P, CTX, if you're not familiar with those. P1 and P is the bone building biomarker. That's osteoblast doing their thing. And then CTX is the bone breakdown biomarker, and the bone breakdown marker is osteoclasts doing their thing. So we can use the ratio between the two to really get a sense of what's happening in the bone. All right, so when you break down the study, you can see that they used the uh, information from the food frequency questionnaire to create what they really thought people were consuming. And if you look at each of the groups here, they have protein, carbs, they have some micronutrients in there. What stood out to me is that from a protein perspective, all the groups were about the same. They were about 85 grams of protein for each group. I would argue that is not enough. It's not terrible, but it's probably not enough. We're generally aiming for one gram per pound coming from animal sources. And if you're going to go plant sources, then you're going to need more than that. Uh, again, this is variable based on the person, but that's kind of our general starting point. And then the carbohydrate content was really high, as you would expect, 220 grams of carbs kind of across the board for all groups. So it's a pretty high carbohydrate, low fat, not quite moderate protein diet. So not what I would recommend for people that with osteoporosis. So then we look at the, um, the, the differences in the groups when it comes to the bone turnover markers. And this is where it gets really interesting. So group A, remember group A is the group that uh, ate a quote unquote random assortment of vegetables, fruits, and herbs. Group A saw the CTX go up from 370 to 400. They used the same units as, as uh, the P1 and P, which is 0 0.37 and 0 0.4. In the US, that would be 370 to 400. And so that's an increase. So what does that mean? What does it mean when CTX goes up? It means that your osteoclast function is increasing. There's more osteoclast function, CTX goes up. So this is about 8.5% 8, 8 increase in CTX. So that could be bad. So we'll see. Group B, the CTX also went up initially. Now, group B is the, the true intervention group, the Scarsborough diet group, the, the highly alkaline polyphenol group. Initially, it went up at six weeks and then went down but it went from essentially 420 to 430 to 410. So that's a 2.4% a drop. Um, clinically, that's really essentially the same thing. Um, group C, kind of same thing, where it didn't really change very much. And this is what they got super excited about coming up here. So hear me out. The P1 and P, which is the bone building marker in group A, went down from 44.2 to 43.3. So what does that mean? It's not a big drop. Clinically, it's about the same. I wouldn't say that that's really significant at all. Um, also, 44 is really not a great starting point, and it didn't change with the intervention for Group A. Remember, the random assortment of, of fruits and vegetables. Group B, the Scarsborough diet group, it went from 49.7 to 45.9, an 8% decrease. And then in the control group, uh, it went from 45 to 46.6. So it actually went up in the control group. Again, is that clinically relevant? Probably not. But what does this tell me? All right, so before we get to the results of the, the renal acid load, the urinary calcium excretion, and what I think of these bone turnover markers, 
Remember that if you haven't gone to our masterclass yet, our totally free masterclass, please do that if you're trying to figure out how to put together your own bone health program. There are so many things you can do to improve your bone health. Check out the free masterclass. I'll walk through all the things that we recommend and consider in our programs and then leave some time for Q&A at the end. If you have done that and you're looking for more support, consider our HealthSpan Nation. HealthSpan Nation is our low-cost monthly fee group where people are supporting each other, asking questions, figuring it out. We have a weekly Zoom-driven Q&A, topic-driven, you ask your own questions, content vault, discount codes, all the things that you need are in there. So if you're on your way and you've been to our masterclass, check out HealthSpan Nation. Links for both of those in the description on YouTube, or you can go to our website, optimalhumanhealth.com. All right, now let's get into these, uh, these findings. So First of all, they talk about the fact that they were successful in producing the renal acid load that they were anticipating as well as the calcium excretion they were anticipating. So when group A consumed the vegetables and the diet that I described compared to group B, there was more renal acid load and they peed out more calcium. Okay, so great. Alkaline diet proven to pee out more calcium. Fine. But let's look at these bone turnover markers because this is so critical. The hypothesis around the alkaline diet is that if you're peeing out more calcium, you're breaking down bone as if that's the only source of calcium in the body. It's not. Remember, we're eating food. So while the bone is there as a source of calcium, your body is smarter than that. It's not going to break that down as a primary source to buffer your pH. There's a lot of ways to buffer pH. Um, your lungs buffer pH, your red blood cells buffer pH, your muscles buffer pH. It's not the only thing that buffers pH. Our body's really good at this. So thinking that we're going to break down bone to do this, I think is really underestimating the complexity of the system in which we live. So this study shows that a high alkaline diet reduces acidity and reduced urine calcium excretion. Great. But what about these bone turnover markers? Now, if you look in the study, they say that this is a success. We slowed down bone turnover, meaning that CTX came down, breakdown came down, and P1 and P came down. So is that success? I don't think so. Think of it like this. If you look at the bisphosphonate drugs, right? So like Fosamax, Reclast, if you look at these drugs that poison osteoclast and CTX comes down, P1 and P is going to come down too because metabolism in our bone is linked. So CTX drops, P1 and P drops. We see it all the time. It's very predictable. When you have a natural mechanism to change bone metabolism, you're going to see the same thing. So while we can reduce bone turnover and maybe even in the long term, make a subtle tweak in bone mineral density, like we do see in the bisphosphonates, right? They do increase bone mineral density. The problem is in the long term, we've got to build bone. So I don't want to do anything that's going to lower my P1 and P. I want my P1 and P to go up. I want more bone building. I want more osteoblast work. I want my P1 and P to go up. So when I look at this study, I say, wow, the alkaline diet actually made this, on average, ratio of P1 and P over CTX worse. I would actually argue that this diet made bone turnover worse when it comes to improving osteoporosis. Now, maybe I'm in the minority here, but this is what we're doing in our practice and we're reversing osteoporosis every day. So I think I'm on the right track here. So let's not be confused by the fact that we that in this, these authors are saying that they're reducing bone turnover and that that's a win. They're reducing bone turnover, but they're suppressing bone building. So take that for what it is. You could also argue that actually none of these changes were particularly clinically relevant anyway. When we see CTX drop, let's say somebody comes in with a CTX of 600 or 700. I want that CTX to go to 200. I want it to be cut in thirds, not by 8%. When I want P1 and P to go up, I want P1 and P to go up by 5X, not by 2%, 8%, whatever. These subtle changes might matter in the short term, but really we need bigger swings than that. So I would argue that this diet did either nothing at all or was potentially even harmful. Now, does that mean that we shouldn't eat fruits and vegetables? No. 
I just don't think that the alkalinity makes any difference whatsoever. I think eat the fruits and vegetables that you want to eat, get the micronutrients that you need. Don't worry about the pH. It is not going to have an impact if you're eating a whole foods diet. Get adequate protein. That is the most important part of a bone healthy diet. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to get off my soapbox. Remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end. There are so many things you can do. Deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.